Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Rotem, and today we'll have a look at a source from the end of the 16th century that tried to explain why bad performances are bad and good performances are good. As musicians and music lovers, we often analyze musical performances and note what we like about them and what not, and what we think is right and what is wrong about them. A fascinating source from 1594 did just that, and shared with us not only their opinion on some of the most talked about musical groups of the time, but also the issues that contributed to performances being good or bad. And most importantly, what musicians can and should do about it. You might be surprised to find out how these things are also relevant today. Let's start. The book we discuss today was written by Ercole Bottrigari, a nobleman, theorist, and music lover from Bologna. The title of the book is Il Desiderio, or of concerti of various musical instruments. The term concerti here doesn't refer simply to concerts, but specifically to the combination of voices with different kinds of instruments. It is also written on the title page that the tuning of these instruments will be discussed, among other musical issues. In fact, most of the book is about tuning, and how the tuning of that time was in line or not with ancient Greek tuning systems as they understood them. What interests us is not so much their understanding of the Greek theories but the information about their contemporary musical practices. Following Greek models, the book is written in the form of a dialogue. It starts with one of the speakers complaining that he went to a concert with about 40 musicians, singers and many different instruments, but it wasn't good. Where I had thought I would hear a celestial harmony, I heard confusion rather than the contrary, accompanied by a discordance, which has offended me rather than given me pleasure. The second speaker answered, The explanation is that very often the instruments are not well tuned together, and can cause nothing but poor concord and disunity, as you have remarked. The first speaker replied, But in the concert which I heard today, I do not believe that it proceeded from that cause, since all the musicians who were performing were excellent artists. Therefore, I maintain that there must be some other reason. And so, it is explained that even when the musicians are excellent and are experienced in tuning their instruments, there are several reasons for the tuning not to be good enough. The first reason is that it is just hard. The writer specifically mentions a group of viols. It takes a good bit of work to tune them well together. It is because the strings do not have any fixed stability, and the same is true of the lutes. He also mentions, what some of you might know very well from experience, that gut strings are less stable than metal strings used on harpsichords, for example. The second reason is that there is a lack of objectivity in tuning. It happens frequently that one voice or one string of an instrument appears slack or low to one player and to another it appears to be tense or high, so that the mixing of various ears and various judgments rapidly becomes confusion. Later in the book, he gives an example. If two maestri were to be given the same starting pitch to tune separately from one another two identical harpsichords, I doubt greatly that by playing the corresponding keys, one would hear any true unisons except the octave of the first unison agreed upon. And what's more, this might be the case also if only one maestro tuned both instruments. That is, beyond the lack of objectivity between different musicians, there is simply human inconsistency. The third reason, which seems to be the most important, is that different instruments use different tuning systems and have different abilities to adapt to one another. And so, Even when the prominent human element and imperfections of the specific instruments at hand are completely disregarded, some combinations of instruments are simply doomed to fail. 
Botrigari divides the instruments into three classes, stable, stable but alterable, and completely alterable. The stable instruments are those whose tuning cannot be altered once it has been set. These include keyboard instruments such as organs and harpsichords, and also harps. The next category, the stable but alterable, include those instruments that have certain basic tuning that they can alter while playing. For example, lutes and viols have open strings which they tune in advance, and then they have the frets that mark each semitone on each string. The frets provide the basic framework, but according to Botrigari and some other sources, it is possible for the diligent player to bend the pitch a little by placing the finger a little higher or a little lower on the fingerboard when they feel the need. Perhaps something like this? Thanks, Ori. And here is how one can bend the pitch on a viol. Perhaps it's easier? Thanks, Steven. Other stable but alterable instruments are wind instruments with holes, such as cornets, flutes, and recorders. Having the holes as their basic framework, they can still flex the tone lightly, either by blowing more or less air, or by gently controlling the coverage of the holes with the fingers. Thank you, Lian. In this way, Botrigari says, expert players can tune their instruments with other ones. The last category of instruments which are completely alterable, Butrigari includes those instruments that can vary their notes extensively. These are rebecs and liras, 16th century instruments which are similar to violins by having some fixed strings, but thanks to the fact that they don't have frets, the strings can be stopped wherever on the neck while playing and within the range of the string, can achieve really whatever pitch should be desired. Thank you, Maya. Also of this group are trombones. These have some notes from the harmonic series as a bass, which are controlled with the lips. But then, by pushing and pulling the slide, the players can achieve within a range, whatever pitch they desire. Thank you, Philip. Later in the text, Butrigari writes that the human voice is also in this group, as it is capable, again within a range, to produce any pitch. But perhaps more importantly, beyond the extent in which instruments can be fine-tuned on the go, there is the issue of what they should be tuned to. For us nowadays, this problem might be hard to grasp. On a most basic level, there are the notes on the piano, and in order to be in tune, everyone should simply align themselves with those. But things were different in the 16th century. Some instruments were bound to a certain tuning or temperament, and interestingly, not all were bound to the same one. If you haven't watched our episode about temperaments, you might want to do it before this next segment. If you did, let's go on. Like other authors in the 16th century, Botrigari sought to show how the musical practice of his time can be legitimized using the authority of Greek and other ancient music theory. In fact, you might know of the so-called Pythagorean tuning, allegedly named after the Greek philosopher Pythagoras from the 6th century BC. Similarly, Botrigari and others connected the temperament used by what he called the stable instruments, keyboards and harps, to Ptolemy, a Roman scholar from the 2nd century. He wrote that the system of Ptolemy is used but tempered or tuned 
according to the custom of the expert makers and tuners of such instruments. It is clear to us, also from the wider context, that he refers to what we nowadays call mintone temperament, where the fifths are tempered, in this case diminished a little bit, in order to favor nice thirds. One of the characteristics of this temperament is that it includes unequal semitones. Some are large semitones and some are small. This, Bottrigari explains, is not the case in the temperament used by instruments with frets, such as lutes and viols, where the tone is divided into two equal semitones, as in the equal temperament used on today's pianos. Also, this tuning was associated with the name of an ancient scholar, this time Aristoxenus, a Greek philosopher from the 4th century BC. You see how in this 17th century depiction of him, he's playing a viol, due to its connection with the equal division of the tone, disregarding the fact that it's obviously not connected to any ancient Greek instruments. Botrigari is not satisfied with theoretical explanations and citations of ancient and contemporary scholars. He suggests, it will be good if we go over to that harpsichord and see and hear whether or not the things I have been telling you are true. We will now make a demonstration similar to the one Botrigari describes. After making sure that our harpsichord is well tuned in mintone, I tuned it now in quarter comma mintone for the effect to be clear, we will give the lute player a G, from which he could tune the rest of his instrument. Now we can compare the two instruments. Oh, and we will simplify and mirror the image of the lute for our convenience. The G should be exactly the same. Very good. The A should be quite close. Okay, but what about the G sharp? Hmm, not okay. As we said, in mintone there are small and large semitones. In this case, the semitone between G and G sharp is a small one, and between G sharp and A, a large one. On the lute and other fretted instruments, according to Botrigari and many other contemporary sources, the tone is divided into two equal semitones. So, while some notes might be more or less in line with the mintone temperament, many are really not. You might be asking why can't we simply move the fret a little so it will also produce a small semitone and so be the same as the harpsichord? Although Botrigari didn't present this as an option, Let's try it ourselves. Nice, now the G-sharp is in tune, but by moving the fret, we affect all the other strings as well, making all of them a small semitone above the open strings, which is problematic. For example, on the lowest course, which is a D, the first fret should be an E-flat which is a large semitone above D. But now, being a small semitone, it is actually a D sharp, much lower than an E flat. Here is the E flat on the harpsichord, and here is the D sharp on the lute. It's not good. It might be this limitation in setting the frets that led equal temperament to be so prevalent on fretted instruments. At this point, however, we must note that while there are plenty of sources describing equal temperament as being common for fretted instruments, there are also sources suggesting other solutions, some of which would make playing with keyboard instruments less problematic. Getting back to Botrigari's categorization of instruments, based on the conflict between mintone and equal temperament, he divided the category of instruments which are stable but alterable into two. The wind instruments, which according to Botrigari are more tuned in the direction of mintone and anyway are very flexible, and the fretted instruments, the lutes and viols, which are tuned in equal temperament and are less flexible. Botrigari explains that it is possible to combine different instruments together, but one must know well 
how to arrange and unite the instruments. The following is a summary of his points. Instruments which are completely alterable can be accompanied by stable instruments, but should make sure to adapt themselves to them. Wind instruments can be accompanied by stable instruments, but need to carefully adapt. Also fretted instruments can be accompanied by stable instruments, but would need to adapt a lot. As we saw, the flexibility that Bottrigari is talking about is not so evident, but it might depend a lot on the instrument, strings, and players. If voices should be accompanied by instruments which are stable but alterable, it should be either winds or fretted instruments, not both. Combining instruments from all the categories together is very problematic, according to Potrigari as too many unstable systems are trying to adapt to each other. He writes, I hold that this cannot be done, except with the greatest disunion, such as you heard today and described to me. I would advise you never to make such a combination of instruments, for it can only be done with the greatest difficulty and it is next to impossible. Artuzzi, the famous theorist, who heavily criticized the madrigals of Monteverdi, also criticized Bottrigari. Apart from claiming that Bottrigari misunderstood some of the issues in Greek music theory, he also thought that Bottrigari's categorization was not useful, and a better one should be focused on tuning systems. Keyboard instruments and harps, which are tuned in mintone, fretted instruments which are tuned in equal temperament, and instruments that can bend in every direction. But regardless of semantics, both Bottrigari and Artuzzi agreed that combining instruments that use different temperaments is very very hard and should be avoided. While these two theorists explained with science and logic why such combinations are to be avoided, in practice it is very clear that they commonly took place. We don't know with what success and how out of tune things sounded, but we assume, however, that good musicians found solutions to make things work, at least in their opinion. After explaining what he sees to be the imperfections of musical performances, Bottrigari mentions some outstanding ensembles that overcome the difficulties. His reasoning about why these ensembles succeed is fascinating. Let's see. When Bottrigari was living in Ferrara between 1576 and 1586, he had the chance to listen to the famous musicians of the Duke of Ferrara. Having been several times to hear and see them in public as well as in private, I feel that the conclusion that I will draw about them is valid for all the other similar concerts, excellent and rare and worthy to be remembered and prized. He explains in two main points the reasons for the excellence of their performances with large ensembles that mix all kinds of instruments together. The first is that they perform no other compositions than one of the two written for this purpose only. There will never be any other composition which brings them to a good accord. The second is that they never perform without substantial preparation. They have not one or two, but a number of rehearsals during which they maintain the highest obedience and attention, and think of nothing except a good ensemble and the greatest possible union without any other consideration. For that reason, each performer comes with gracious modesty when he needs to be instructed and corrected by the director of music. The frequent and so to say continuous conversing, singing and playing together of the singers and instrumentalists work largely to perfect this union and to lessen and minimize the great imperfections of so many kinds of instruments playing at the same time. So according to Bottrigari, the imperfections are there, but the musicians are doing their utmost best to minimize them. Another beautiful description of an ensemble is of four men who used to meet in the evenings and after rehearsing some canzoni, were going around town singing them. Notice 
Here, there is no issue of mixing different kinds of instruments. It's just about four singers who try to be in tune when singing a cappella, a difficult subject to which we dedicated an episode in the past. Botrigari describes the singers. Their desire to perfect this kind of harmony with perfect union was such that besides seeking many times the useful advice of the maestro di cappella of the cathedral, they never ceased to admonish each other most kindly about their own defects. And finally, standing closely together, they demonstrated that as they were united almost as closely as they could be with their bodies, of which they would indeed have wished to be able to make one body only, likewise, they delighted in making as far as they could a true union of their respective voices, from which then came forth, I will say, an almost celestial harmony. Also here, Botrigari stresses the amount of will and dedication these musicians are putting in order to be in tune, and that even with the best of efforts, it is only almost celestial. The last group that Botrigari mentions is an ensemble of nuns from the convent in San Vito in Ferrara. While normally the concerto of the nuns was only heard, Botrigari writes that he had the good fortune not only to have been able to hear it, but also to see it being assembled and effectively concerted together. Botrigari witnessed the 23 nuns, singers and instrumentalists, conducted by the maestra, and was completely stupefied, saying, It appeared to me that the persons who ordinarily participated in this concert were not human bodily creatures, but were truly angelic spirits. After being amazed by the fact that they were women, that all of them studied their instruments with the one maestra, and that no man had instructed them in anything, he tried to find some explanations for them being so good. The first is that they perform rather rarely, only on important occasions, and never extemporaneously, nor in haste, nor do they play all compositions, but only, as I said about the great concert of the Duke, those works judged appropriate to be performed. The second is about their tasteful diminution playing. Their diminutions are not of the kind that is chopped up, furious and continuous, such that it spoils and distorts the original part, but at times, and in certain places, there are such light, vivacious embellishments that they enhance the music and give it the greatest spirit. This point is then further discussed by Botrigari, explaining how in the case of bad ensembles, performances are ruined because of the presumptuous audacity of performers who try to invent diminutions almost continuously, all trying to move at the same time as if in a diminution-making contest. And sometimes, in order to show their skills, they move so far away from the counterpoint of the proposed piece with such intricacy of dissonances between them that an unbearable confusion inevitably ensues. Interestingly, Artusi in his treatise also described the amazing nuns of San Vito. A great mixture of all kinds of instruments and voices was heard at the same time with such great agreeableness and sweetness of harmony that it really seemed that it was the Mount of Parnassus there, that paradise itself had opened, and that it was not some human thing. And like Botrigari, he tried to explain why it sounded so good, and drew conclusions on what are the conditions to create something like it. Here are some of his points. 1. The place of the concert must be a resonant place, and one that responds in the furthest parts, and does not devour the voices and sounds, but nourishes and conserves them in their entirety, until they have reached the ears of the listeners. 2. The distance between the performers and the listeners has to be optimal. 3. The pieces must be by excellent composers, and more specifically, the parts of the composition should be in ranges which are comfortable for the musicians, stay within their limits, which makes the concert easier, more unified, and much more pleasing to the listeners.
and accordingly, each performer should sing in the range which is most comfortable for them and play the instruments which they are best at. Four, and this is a beautiful point, the musicians should perform more with their ears than with their voices or instruments. It is necessary that they listen to each other, and in listening to each other, that one has judgment not to surpass his companion, either with the voice or playing instruments. In so doing, an equality of the voices and sounds will be heard, in such an agreeable manner that the listeners will take infinite pleasure from it. Artusi notes that when this point is not respected, the reason for this error is none other than the envy that one has for the other. 5. The instruments themselves have to be excellent and have a uniform sound across their range. 6. Only one person should tune all the instruments, due to the fact that different people hear differently. To summarize everything, he says that when combining different kinds of instruments, and due to all the other points he mentioned, musicians cannot attain the true goal, which is to delight perfectly, but they can delight imperfectly, as there are many defects both on the part of the instruments and the players. What I like about Potrigari and Artusi is that while they try to use logic and science, they also refer to the imperfect human element, and both admit that with much effort it is possible to make amazing things, even if they can never be truly perfect. This was our show about Potrigari and Artusi. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information. If you enjoy early music sources, consider supporting it on Patreon. Comment, share and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.